morning, everybody. Thank you for your patience. You know, technology, when you think you, know, you have it all together, it reminds you, you don't. So, super glad to see you all together. This is, what's it been, about two months? It's been about 20 years. 20 years since we've been together. Um, excited, excited to see all your faces. And uh, before we get started, for those of you on our live stream who, um, you might be your first time joining us. We have our Facebook Live over here. Um, we're just going to introduce ourselves up here. I'm Pastor Austin, the assistant pastor here at the church. I'm Ace. I play guitar. I'm here. My name is Ace Bettersfield. My name is Grace Bettersfield. Cool. And they are siblings. Yes. yes. That's why we're so close. <laughs> so um, I was. Th we're, our first song is going to be "What a Friend We Have in Jesus." Um, and we passed out some music a bit ago, but now more of you have shown up, so you may not have a sheet. But we're glad you're here, anyways. And uh, you can hum if you forget a word. I think of uh, our next song is Because He Lives. I think of how easy it is to have a sense of security and think it's coming from us. That I'm safe from harm or I'm accepted by people because of what I do. And um, it reminds me of Israel wandering the wilderness for 40 years. They were wandering and wandering and wandering. And they had a cloud with God in it by day. And they had a pillar of fire leading them. And it was God by night. But I think they would forget that he was there. And they would think that uh, they were alive on their own strength. They forgot that the whole way God was taking care of them. That he was the reason why they lived another breath. And um, it's a powerful statement to proclaim to the universe, the world, that God is the reason why we have life. 
um, that earth is not just turning round and round um, on its own, but God is keeping us moving because he's a faithful father, and he's always been that way to us. So sing with us as we proclaim God's care for us, and because he lives... freedoms. Amen? Amen. And in this country, God has blessed us with the rights of freedom of choice and freedom of religion and freedom of conscience and freedom of speech. And when those things are infringed upon, it makes us frustrated, it makes us angry, and it leads us to distrust um, those who are infringing on our rights. And I'm not trying to make a political statement, but I'm making one statement. This is a world where your rights are not guarded by another human being per se, ultimately our rights are guarded, but guarded by the God of this universe. Amen. The King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, who's keeping this world running. The word tells us he puts up kings and takes them down in the book of Daniel. And regardless of how frustrated or afraid I may be, my life, always rests in the hands of Jesus, hands of my Savior. That's what, he's, that's what we see in Scripture. Jesus prayed for his disciples. 
And he prays for us as our mediator in heaven. And so in this song, we are claiming that above all powers and kings and in difficult circumstances, I have no want. As David said in Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. So what is comforting you in these times? If you've been upset, if you've been worried, don't go to anything else except Jesus. He's all that gives us the comfort we need. And if you believe in him, you're part of his family. And as, a, as he is a father, he takes care of his family. Amen? Amen. Yeah. So let's sing above all above all and, uh, it might sound a little acapella because we don't have these things mic'd in but <laughs> Austin. It's so great to see each of you here. I was just talking with some and we were saying we took it all for granted before, didn't we? That we just see everybody every Sabbath and now that we haven't been able to, I'm really treasuring this moment right now. And I'm thanking God for this beautiful day that he's given us. Yes, I was a little bit worried. Yes, some of you were praying with me. 
when it said uh, yesterday in the weather forecast that I saw, 20% chance of rain, I thought, hmm, not so good. But uh, thank, we'd like to thank the Pathfinders for loaning us their tent shelter and for the volunteers that helped put it up. And uh, we're going to use it a number of weeks here. We don't know exactly how long. Uh, we'll be using it, we're planning to use it every week except for June 20 when we'll join with the Upper Columbia Conference camp meeting by live stream that day. So, uh, lots of good things happening. Just welcome. Welcome to you. If you're a guest with us today, welcome. If you're a member who hasn't been here for a while, and uh, we're just glad you're here. Uh, our, we will not be passing an offering plate or bag but we do have an offering box. So any offerings can be placed in the Joash box. There are, is, does anyone need a tithe and offering envelope right now? Just raise your hand and Stan Way will bring you an offering envelope. So if you just raise your hand right now, if you need an offering envelope, and you can just place that in the Joash box. And if you're using a pen, there's a whole bunch of pens over there, but if you use a pen, just drop it into the offering box you know, where we can uh, disinfect uh, afterwards. All right, uh, we are continuing to meet together every Wednesday night for prayer meeting. You're invited to join us. We're meeting every Thursday night for Bible study. You're invited to join us for our Revelation Bible study. All you, for all those, just go to the church website and click on those events, and that uh, and that uh, zooms you right into a Zoom uh, Zoom uh, study and prayer time. I've got a question for you. How many of you? Don't raise your hand. How many of you have joined our Project Hello? What is Project Hello? Project Hello is something that we've been doing for a number of weeks. We're encouraging every member to pick up the phone and call at least one person a day from church. Could be a guest, could be a member. You know, we're isolated from each other, but if all of us talk to one person, a different person each day, we can keep connected all around the network and circle. And it's not hard. I've been trying to do that. I've been uh, making more than one call a day and encourage you to do that. So next Sabbath, we're going to take a raise of hands and see who's in on Project Hello. Okay, Andrew. Andrew, did you read the bulletin last week and know about Project Hello? I just have a quick testimonial on that, uh, Project Hello. And it's not an all or nothing project. In fact, maybe you only do it two days a week, um, like me. But um, anyway... The idea is is getting in there, and I opened up the church directory, and I was looking for some phone numbers, and I realized that when I open up the church directory, I see names of people that I haven't thought of in a long time. And um, anyway, so that was just really cool. So I actually called up two different people that I had no intention of calling up, um, and it was just a really neat opportunity, and now God is going to have to use those, use those conversations that I had to to bless those people, but... It's amazing what happens when you open up that church directory and you see people that maybe you hadn't thought of and maybe God puts it on your heart to call them. It might happen for you too. Amen. Thank you, Andrew. Appreciate that. Uh, who's graduating? Uh, if you know of people who are graduating, students who are graduating from eighth grade, high school, college, graduate school, uh, call in the information, leave it on the church answering machine or text it to me, either one. Uh, we want to honor them by uh, printing their names, their degrees, uh, their school, in our church bulletin this next Sabbath. Uh, we have membership transfers. Some of these have been waiting quite a while, so uh, we commend them for their patience. Uh, we have uh, transferring out Kelly Camp to Othello, Doug Carey to All Nations, Emily Carr to Tucson, Philippine, American Seventh-day Adventist Church, Benjamin Crockett to Summit Northwest Ministries Adventist Church. And we have coming in, and we're so glad for Judy and Roger Worley transferring here from Orcas 
Adventist fellowship out on the island. So uh, do we have a motion that we uh, accept these requests for transfer of membership? We have a motion, we have a second. Second, all in favor, just raise your hand. And uh, we wish those who are transferring out all of God's blessing. And we want to see even more transferring in. So welcome Judy and uh, Roger. Here's the news. It's a crime story right on our own campus. Our second literature box out by the mailbox has been stolen. The first one is stolen, the second one is stolen, and now the third one will be in the new location in the foyer of the Friendship Center. So you can stop during the week and pick up uh, literature. There's also some uh, uh, young people's and children's magazines on the welcome table right here today as well. Now, I saved good news for last, and that good news is that uh, to this Monday is Lynn Lamberton's 91st birthday. Isn't that fantastic? So let's give him a big hand. Okay, so uh, we've got lots of 90-year-olds in our church that are active and ministering and uh, doing things, and so uh, we praise God for that. Also, uh, Bob and Naomi Coons are celebrating their 65th wedding anniversary on June 19. There's an address and a uh, uh, where and an email address where you can send them a congratulations and a greeting. So congratulations to Bob and Naomi. Let's give them a big hand. I'm not sure about this percussion section up here. Psalm 95, O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving. Let us shout joyfully to him with psalms, for the Lord is the great God, the great King above all gods. And then at the end of this psalm it says, Today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion, as in the day of trial in the wilderness, when I swore to them, they shall not enter my rest. Let's enter God's rest and peace today. What do you say? Opening hymn is going to be amazing grace. privilege to show our love for God by supporting his mission in this world. 
that's the privilege we have as we return our tithes and our give of our offerings. And that's part of worship, isn't it? It's, it's a part of worship that we do during the week, and we plan for that so that we can do share in that part of worship as we worship together. As we mentioned, today any offerings will go into the Joash box, and you can mark on it uh, what that uh, offering should be directed toward. We have a children's story today. Pastor Austin has a story for our kids. And so, Pastor Austin, are you ready? Yes. Oh, my. I better get out of here. There's a, a, a herd coming through. As you can see, I have a little zoo here. I will push this. We got all sorts of animals in here. Here's one you'll recognize, kids. What kind of animal is this, kids? It is a? We got some golden retrievers or something. We've got an orangutan and a kangaroo. What else we got here? We have a giraffe and a bison. We have a bison. We have all sorts of animals here. There are all kinds. Who, between these three animals, would like to ride a bison. Anybody, any hands? Who'd like to ride a bison if it wasn't gonna throw you around? Anybody wanna jump with a kangaroo in Australia? Or your local zoo? How about uh, swinging through the trees with the orangutan? Anybody? I think these are all special little animals. Um, no matter what they look like, no matter how big they are, how small they are, and Jesus made them that way, all different. They make different sounds, they eat different foods, and they spend their days differently. But does that make them any less special If they, because they do different things? No. I'm going to tell you a story that Jesus told to a group of people, but from a different perspective. This story you could find in Luke 15, verses 3 to 7. And uh, I'll, it's called the, the shepherd and the one lost, or the one sheep and the 99 sheep. So here's how our little story will go. Once upon a time, there was a funny orangutan named Frankie and a jumpy kangaroo named Kevin and a sweet bison named Bertha. <laughs> now Frankie, Kevin, and Bertha were great friends. And they would play in the jungles and the forests and the mountains all day long, every day. But Mo Frankie would teach them how to swing from the trees, although Bertha didn't do so well with that. And Kevin preferred to stay on the ground himself. And one day, someone new came into the neighborhood. And that was our puppy friend, Sweetie. Now, Sweetie was, had never been in this area before. She didn't know anybody. And so when she first came to the forest and saw Frankie, Kevin, and Bertha playing, she was nervous to say hi. But she waved her little paw and said, Hey, everybody, can I come play with you? You know what they did? They just stared at her. Frankie, Bertha, and Kevin had never seen a dog before. And it was strange to them. So they ignored Sweetie. Because of that, she got sad and walked off by herself. And she just played along on her own. 
But soon enough, Frankie, Kevin, and Bertha realized they needed to go home. And they thought they should at least walk home with Sweetie. So they invite her, and they all walk home together. And they have a blast. They find soon enough, they have all sorts of similarities. They all like eating bananas. They learned that one from Frankie. They all like running through the trees. They all like sunshiny weather. And so they sort of, because of that, they played every day. They were so, they realized how similar they really were. Now one day, they were playing, and they just kind of got lost track of Sweetie. And uh, they ran home for dinner and just forgot that she was part of the group. And so all the parents get together and say, hey, where's Sweetie? Where did she go? And they didn't know. So they decided to send some out to go find Sweetie. Now the kids were nervous and they thought, why are the, everyone is so scared, we're not getting dinner. <laughs> They're going to look for Sweetie, but we wanted dinner. And they were a little upset. They understood that Sweetie's well-being was more important than a plate of bananas. The parents went out and they looked and looked and looked and the sun was setting and they looked and looked and looked. And then they heard a little whimper. And the whimper turned into a yelp. And the yelp turned into a bark. And there she was. She was sitting under a tree by herself and she didn't know how to get home. So all the parents walked her back home and they all ate bananas together. And Frankie, Bertha, and Kevin realized that there's no nothing as important as the safety of their friends. That's really important to them. And they were young, they really liked the bananas, but they learned that day that the safety of their friends was the most important thing. Now, you'll find in Luke the same story. Jesus telling to a group of believers. Telling to a group of believers. Sorry about that. He tells the story of a group of hundred sheep, and one of them doesn't come back home to the barn, and it's lost. And so the shepherd goes out to find one sheep. And you might ask, well, what about the 99? Aren't they important too? Don't they need to be protected and all these things? And Jesus says, yes. But the one sheep is the one that's in danger, one that needs protection, the one that needs immediate help. And so we find here this little story. Suppose you, uh, one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not repent. All of us are that one sheep. And when we come into the fold, we're those 99. And we learn that Jesus doesn't care about one of us more than the other. He looks for those who are in danger. And we as Christians as well, um, we enjoy relative safety. And when one of our, our brothers and sisters, our family of, of, of humanity, um, needs support, special support, special um, backing, protection, um, we ought to step in as Jesus did. good to be back at church. I, just, I, I have been missing this for so long. Um, it's time for our morning prayer. I'm going to kneel. You can stay seated, kneel, stand, whatever works easiest for you. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. We come before you this morning humbled in your presence, in awe of your majesty and faithfulness your love and forgiveness 
your wisdom and your holiness. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Father, as we look around, we don't see much of your will being done. But we ask because you taught us to ask. We ask that your will would be done in our lives, in our church, our community, our government, our country, and our world. Give us this day our daily bread. We ask for what we need. Help us not to hoard your gifts, rather to be generous. Help us to remember the only reason we have anything is because you have given it, and your gifts aren't meant to be stockpiled. Deliver us from our selfishness and greed. And help us not to think only of physical food, but also to eat daily of your living word. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. In this time of uncertainty, it's so easy to blame others. I heard these this week. If people would just wear masks, the people of Yakima, it's their fault. Fruit warehouse owners, they don't care about their employees. It's not the employee's fault, the owners are to blame. Or healthcare workers aren't getting the coronavirus at the hospital. They're careless, away from work. It's certainly not the administrators. The employees are to blame. It's scary to know that people are dying. Surely this must be somebody's fault. Change us, Lord. Help us to be different, not blaming others, but looking to unify as we find ourselves in a situation that doesn't have clear answers. And not just different, help us to be peculiar even because our hearts are not failing us with fear. We do still have hope, the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Help us to share this message of hope with our neighbors. We recognize you as the great healer and we ask for healing from this virus, for our county, which has been so hard hit, and for our country and for the world, people that are suffering around the world. It's so easy to see evil in other people, We've seen Satan at work in the killing of George Floyd. Help us not to be outraged this week and then go back to normal next week. Give us insight into how we treat others. Do we, do I, act or even think evil instead of love because someone is different? Forgive us and recreate us to see each person the way you see them, created in the image of God. You are so faithful to forgive us Every time we ask, help us to offer this same gift to others, remembering that you forgive us as we forgive others. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Your word tells us you never tempt anyone. Rather, we allow Satan to tempt us when we are drawn away from, your, from you by our own desires. Deliver us from this evil of leaving your side, creating us a clean heart, O oh God and renew a right spirit within us. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Testing one, two, three. Testing one, two, three. Can you check and see if I'm on the uh, remote here, on the lavalier? What's that? It says the lavalier should work. So I'm, I'm on. Here. You're on. on. I'm on. Okay. Testing one, two, three. Testing. You're on. Testing You're one, two, on. three. You're on. You can hear? Okay. Testing one, two, three. Testing. Testing one, two, three. Uh, Testing one, two, three, testing. Testing one, two, three. Testing, testing one, two, three. Testing, testing one, two, three. I can shout, but. Test, testing one, two, three. Hey, I can hear it. Woo. All right. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Pastor Oscar. Thank you to Jeff Wallace and others who got it set up this morning. And, uh, Wow, uh, it's just great to be back. I will uh, just mention that I was uh, maybe the text, O ye of little faith, might apply to your pastor. 
because I wore a, a fleece uh, a fleece long sleeve underneath my shirt today because I thought, wow, it's going to be cold out there. Actually, it feels really good, doesn't it? And there's Joe back there in his short sleeves, dressed appropriately, and I'm a little overdressed. But uh, anyway, it's good. Uh, God's good. And uh, the thunder I heard up there is, it doesn't seem to be dropping anything down on us, so that's good too. But uh, just a week and a half ago, a store clerk suspected that a man had just passed a counterfeit $20 bill in a purchase. Called the police. Police came, four policemen came. Um, asked the man to get out of his car, walked him down the sidewalk, pushed him to the ground, cuffed his hands behind his back, one of the officers laid his knee on his neck hard as the man cried out for air, and George Floyd died on the sidewalk of Minneapolis. Something's wrong with this picture. This is injustice. Uh, this appears to be racism. The courts will have to figure all that out. This is breaking God's Ten Commandments. You shall not murder. We need a break. We need a break. We need a break from cruelty and prejudice. What do you say? And we can share the, the message of Jesus, the message of justice for all, for, with liberty and justice for all. We can share that as it applies to our specific situation right here in Yakima and the Yakima Valley. We have plenty of opportunities to share that message here and put it into action here in our valley and make this a better, even a better place. The uh, coronavirus has changed our lives, true or false? <laughs> true. <laughs> uh, it's changed our plans. It's Thank you. Uh, it's changed. It's changed graduations. It's canceled graduations. Uh, we have lots of graduates in our church who are going to have a very different kind of graduation, often a virtual graduation online. It's put some of us out of work. It's separated us from family members and friends and uh, our church family. Now, all, though all the preventive measures are important, we need a break from this. Amen? Yeah. We're getting tired of this. Over 100,000 Americans have died already from COVID-19. But every year, every year, every year, more than 600,000, 600,000 die from heart disease one in every four deaths, and that's, they're almost all preventable with healthy diet and exercise. We need a break from that too, amen? amen. Millions of people around this world know about Jesus. They've heard about Jesus, but a majority of these, including some Adventist Christians, have not found the peace and the power and the rest of fully trusting each day of their lives into the hands of Jesus. We need a break. We need life and we need, we need hope and we need rest. Now some of you are saying, Pastor, I've had too much rest. I've been homebound for two months now and uh, I'm getting sick of that. All I have is rest. I'm tired of looking at a TV screen or a computer screen. I want to do something besides just rest. Well, I don't think that's most of us that have had that experience. I've been more busy than usual uh, with, during this time, and maybe you have too. But many thousands want peace. They want, they desire uh, a rest, but they don't know where to turn. So I turn to where they would have to turn. I Googled, how can I find peace? I just spoke that right into my phone. Hey Siri, yes, what can I do to help you? 
How can I find peace? And up popped some websites. Here's what they had to say. The positive thinking website. 15 things to do. One, simplify your life. Two, reduce stress. Three, solve your problems. Right, but how do you do that? Or Tiny Buddha's website. One, do the next right thing. And two, complain less. Okay. Uh, you know, some of these have some value. They, they help us in some way, possibly. But where is the, what about the deep, solid, lasting peace of mind that only God can give? Jesus talked about peace and rest because in his high-stress, persecuted life, he was persecuted about every day of his life. That was just part of the normal for him, persecution slurs against him and his family. But in all of that, he experienced peace. How did he do that? He knows what it is to experience peace in troubled times, and he knows you need peace and rest, and he's willing to give it to you. So, instead of 15 steps from Jesus, or a three-month course, Jesus simply offers to give you peace. Amen. That's it. He offers to give it to you as a gift. But it's very different than what the world gives. As Jesus said in John 14, verse 27. If you have a Bible, turn with me to John 14, verse 27. And here Jesus says, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Peace I leave with you. I give you my peace. It's different than the world's peace. It's not like the world's solutions, but it's simply Jesus saying, relax, trust in me, invite me to direct your life each morning. Jesus is always good on his promises. What do you say? He said he'd give you peace. You ask him. Dedicate your life to him. He will give you that peace. You know, Jesus knew he had to have God's power in his life every day. Maybe that's not thunder. Maybe that's just wind noise. What do you think? <laughs> Okay, it's not as uh, dire as I thought it was. Let's see what we got. It's the wind on your mic. It's wind on my mic. I don't think I'm blowing on it. I think it's the wind. All right, so uh, just be glad it's not thunder, right? Amen. You know, so Jesus, he knew he had to have God's power. That's why one night he never went to bed. He stayed up all night and he prayed all night long. He was really earnest about praying for himself, for his for strength, but also for his followers. And he was also making some decisions, some very important decisions. We need to pray more when we're making important decisions. Amen? Uh, there are young people that are making decisions right now. Where to go to college? You know, uh, who to date? Uh, what to do for a life career? Well, those are important decisions. They're life decisions. What am I going to do with Jesus? All of us make that decision every day. Those are times to pray more and ask God for his direction. And so Jesus prayed all night. And that morning he woke up. He didn't wake up. He was refreshed without going to sleep. He, was, he did not feel tired. He did not feel exhausted. He got up and he called up onto the mountainside 12 of his many followers. He selected 12 out of the group and he called them, he commissioned them. He commissioned them as apostles. And apostles means the, the sent out ones, the ones who are sent out, the ones who, are, who go on a mission to teach and to heal. And uh, so, maybe with some trepidation, maybe with some nervousness, I think, they headed out, like Jesus told them, two by two, 
And they didn't really know exactly where they were going. They were just kind of directed by the Holy Spirit. But when they returned, they were excited. They were pumped. They were, they were, they were overjoyed because they had seen God work in people's lives. They had seen lives changed. And in Matthew 25, 11, verse 25, Matthew eleven twenty five. 25, Jesus speaks after they come back. It says, at that time, Matthew eleven twenty five, 25, Jesus answered and said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and prudent and have revealed them to babies. Who are the babies? The apostles. They are just infant disciples, just barely getting started. And Jesus is saying, you know, the scribes and Pharisees, they don't get it. And they've had all this education. But these fishermen and just common people, they are listening and the Holy Spirit is teaching them. So Jesus was saying to the religious leaders, look at Matthew 12, verses 7 through 8, next chapter. Look at uh, Matthew 11, 28, Jesus gives an invitation. He says, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you what? Rest. Rest. That's what we need. Rest. Not just physical rest, but spiritual rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find what? Rest for your souls. Spiritual rest. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And so what Jesus is saying here is if you team up with me there'll be work to do yes you'll be in the yoke with me but there is a spiritual rest that will refresh you now Matthew, uh, this this Jesus talks about in chapter 12 it goes right on to the next chapter and it's still on the theme of rest Sabbath rest because what does the word Sabbath actually mean the word Sabbath actually means what? Rest or ceasing. Stopping what you were doing so you can experience the presence of God in, an, in a special way. So, of course, Sabbath, Shabbat, rest, ceasing, that's part of what we read in the Bible, in the Old Testament and the New Testament. So the next chapter, Matthew 12, tells about one Sabbath morning... And Jesus and his disciples are walking to church, and because they haven't eaten any breakfast, the disciples uh, are gleaning. And it was legal to do that. They were able to glean the edges of the field, and they picked some heads of wheat, and they were rubbing in their hands, and they were eating the kernels. Well, guess who came along right then on the way to the same synagogue? Pharisees. And they, were, they had memorized their 600 and some rules, and they... Uh, instantly asserted their authority and they said to Jesus your disciples are acting in a lawless manner they are breaking the Sabbath and Jesus looked at them he, he gave them some answer from some Bible stories but then he said in chapter 12 Matthew chapter 12 verse 7 and 8 but if you had known what this means, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the guiltless. Not guilty, but guiltless. For the Son of Man is Lord even of the what? The Sabbath day. So what Jesus is saying here is, you scribes and Pharisees, if you knew who I really am, the creator of the Sabbath, the Lord of the Sabbath, you would follow his example of mercy and kindness and spiritual rest. And it goes on telling other great stories about Sabbath in that chapter. It's the key Sabbath chapter in the book of Matthew. rest. Whether it was to Pharisees or fishermen, whether it was to housewives or teenagers, Jesus' message was the same. Come to me, all you who are tired and weary and worried, 
and I will give you rest. What a promise. You know, in these challenging and, and, and frustrating COVID times, it's frustrating, isn't it, honestly? It's, it's getting old now, right? It's, it's not cute anymore. It's not novel anymore. It's just like, when are we going to get there? Are we there yet? No, we're probably not going to be able to open our church for worship based on the health statistics of our county for at least two more months. That's where we're at right now. But praise God, God's opened up the opportunity for us to be able to meet outdoors up to 100 people. So we praise God for that. God's opened the way to do that. So, so these are times when we need God's love. We need God's peace and his rest in our hearts. We need that endurance and that patience. You know, one of the most unusual books in the New Testament uh, speaks about rest, the rest that God offers. It's the book of Hebrews. And the book of Hebrews is very uh, unique. Uh, we don't know who wrote it. You know, Paul usually begins with his own name, Paul and Timothy, to the church in, you know, in Ephesus and so on. And then at the end he signs it again, says, this is my own signature, Paul. You know, you can know this is genuine. This letter doesn't have anything like that. It just starts in with a spiritual message. But this book was actually written by Paul, or maybe it was a sermon preached by Paul. But he evidently did it for the did it for Jewish Christians. And so he was probably speaking in Aramaic. And then later it was translated into Greek by someone else, probably Barnabas. In fact, some of the early Christian writers, uh, after the time of the apostles, said that Barnabas is the one who translated the book of Hebrews from Aramaic into Greek. Well, that's the book is simple. It's all about Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the best. That's the theme of the book of Hebrews. Jesus Christ is superior. Jesus Christ is better than all the Jewish Mosaic rituals. All the Mosaic rituals, Jesus is better. He fulfills them all. He's superior. And he's, Jesus is man and God, both. He's the creator. He's the high priest. He is the giver of Sabbath rest. He is the one who is our sacrifice. He's all these things. He's much better than anything else. Amen? Is he much better than anything else in your life? Is he? Amen. Turn in your Bible to Hebrews chapter 3. Hebrews chapter 3 is a great uh, chapter, 3 and 4, as we talk about this concept of spiritual rest. Spiritual rest. Hebrews chapter 3, verses 14, 15, and 19. For we have become partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. Verse 15, while it is said, now he's quoting from the Bible, Old Testament, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. At the beginning of this worship service, we quoted some praise from Psalm 95. This also is Psalm 95. He's just, Paul has just quoted all verses 7 through 11 from Psalm 95. Now he's going to repeat it a bunch of times to emphasize it. Today, if you hear his voice, today, this very day, don't harden your heart as in the rebellion. Verse 19. So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. Who's Paul talking about? Who could not enter in because of unbelief? Who? The Israelites, out in the wilderness, had to spend 40 years out there until that generation died off, simply because they didn't have enough faith to believe that God could deliver Canaan into their hands. God was ready to do it, but they balked, they squawked, they wouldn't do it, they wouldn't march forward, they chickened out. God said, well, I've got to have people who have faith if we're going to see some miracles. Friends, this can be the group 
that believes in Jesus and believes in God's miracles where God can uh, let his power out into this valley. What do you say? Amen. We can be those ones. And so Paul says, so we see that they did not enter in because of unbelief, but we can hear his voice today and open our hearts instead of hardening our hearts. And then he continues on. Therefore, chapter 4, verse 1, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 1. Therefore, since a promise remains of entering his rest, let us fear lest any of you should seem to have come short of it. What? Some people in the church who believed in Jesus could come short? Could come up short? Yes. They could be just like the Hebrews in the desert. They could have be short on faith and come up short. The, the, uh, I think our camera just went down. Verse 2, For indeed the good news was preached to us as well as to them, but the word which they heard did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in those who heard it. So you see, there it is. It's those out in the wilderness, they didn't mix faith with God's promises, and they lost out. God wanted to give them rest. And the rest that he was talking about was rest in the promised land. A place to rest after wandering so long, after being at war. A place to rest for their families, a secure, safe place to rest. But they did not get that rest. That generation died off in the wilderness. The book of Hebrews is a message that was especially meaningful for Jewish Christians in A.D. 65. Why do I say A.D. 65? Because A.D. 65 was about the time that the book of Hebrews was written. And what was happening in Judea in A.D. 65? It was the beginnings of the first Jewish revolt. It was the beginnings of the Zealot Rebellion. And uh, the, the revolt was fanning the flames of war against the Within five years from A.D. 65, A.D. 70, that beautiful, world-famous temple in Jerusalem, the stones toppled off, toppled over, and all of the, just strewn like a, like a mess on the temple plaza and dumped down over the wall. I've stood at that wall, the western wall. The only thing that's left is the bulkhead wall of the plaza of what was so beautiful then in Jesus' day. Destroyed just five years after the book of Hebrews was written. And already the tensions were mounting and the people were worried and they could see that war was coming. And so that's why Paul is writing to them how you can have rest and faith and power and courage even in troubled times. Even when the political scene is all mixed up. So people were confused and afraid. The ocean broke out. No matter what, the experience Christ's peace rest. So Paul, now in verse 15, is quoting from uh, uh, Psalm 95. Israel couldn't go into the promised land. God wants to give us now today spiritual rest. And so that's what Paul's moving toward. He said, David said, today... God's promise is still true for spiritual rest. So if it was true for David's time, then it's also true for our time. It's also true for 2020 AD. God's promise of spiritual rest still remains. So Paul is now speaking to Christians, to spiritual Israel. He says we can claim God's promise today. Now we come to the key verses that make it really plain. Really plain. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 9. There remains therefore a rest, a spiritual rest, a lasting rest for the people of God. Let's stop right there. That text is a very important text in the Bible because it has one word in it 
that's not used anywhere else in the Bible. And that is that word rest. Some of the modern translations translate it even more accurately. They translate it, there still remains, therefore, a Sabbath rest for the people of God. That's what it says in the original Greek. Therefore, there still remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. That word is sabbatismos in Greek. Sabbatismos, it means Sabbath rest. Sabbath rest, it's the only place it's used in the entire Bible. Well, what is that? What is this Sabbath rest? Is, is Paul trying to convince the Jewish Christians that they should keep the seventh-day Sabbath? What do you think? Uh, no. Jewish Christians would naturally be keeping the seventh-day Sabbath, right? And how, how about all the Christians in A.D. 65? Were they keeping the seventh-day Sabbath? Yeah. yeah. Gentile or Jew, they were all keeping the seventh-day Sabbath. You can read that in the book of Acts all the way through. It's The New Testament church was a seventh-day Sabbath-keeping movement. Man-made changes came later, after the death of all the apostles. So Paul was not trying to convince them to keep the Sabbath. He was using the seventh-day Sabbath of the Ten Commandments, the one that Jesus kept, the one that he said he was the Lord of, the one that has a special blessing built into it because he blessed the Sabbath day. Paul is using that seventh day Sabbath as an example of spiritual resting peace in Jesus. That's what it is. Look, verse 10, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 10. If you have a Bible, turn there. there verse 9, there remains therefore a Sabbath rest for the people of God. Verse 10, it explains it now. For he who has entered his rest has himself also ceased from his works as God did from his. Do you get the point? It's a very interesting point. It's a surprising point. Paul's saying, look, when God, create, and when God the Father and Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit created this world, Genesis chapter 1, Many New Testament passages say that Jesus is the one who actually created the world. That God created the world through, or the worlds even, in Hebrews, through Jesus Christ. Jesus was the actual voice of creation. He's the one who spoke the universe into existence. And Paul's saying, if that God took a day off and rested from all his good works then you need to rest from all your good works for salvation. You're not supposed to rest from your good works. We're supposed to go out and do loving, good, and obedient works. But to earn our salvation, Paul's saying, you follow God's example and you cease from your good works for salvation. That's what he's saying. There it is. For he who has entered his rest has himself, that's you and me by God's grace, ceased from his works, ceased from our works, ceased from our good works, like God ceased from his good works in Genesis 1 and 2, as God did from his. So Paul is using this as a way of telling the Jewish Christians you are not going to go to heaven because you're good. You're not going to be able to earn your salvation by keeping the commandments, even the fourth commandment, even the Sabbath commandment. Yes, God says, I want you to keep my commandments. If you love me, keep my commandments. But that's not what saves you. You're saved by the grace of God. And you enter into that rest even now, that will be expanded to its ultimate when Jesus comes and we enter into the heavenly rest of heavenly Canaan, the heavenly promised land. Amen? Amen. Amazing passage God gives us. He wants us to come into a rest relationship with Him. Every Sabbath should remind us of God's love and grace. Amen?
every Sabbath reminds us to make Christ the focus of each day of the week, to dedicate each day to his transforming power, to become more and more like Jesus through his power and through the Holy Spirit's power every day. We cease from our good works as God did from his for salvation. Does that sound like kind of cheap grace? Is someone thinking, wow, has the pastor gone off the deep end? Uh, you know, is he, is he just kind of throwing it out there that, you know, everyone's going to be saved? No. Is this just sort of a do-as-you-please religion that we're promoting here? Absolutely not. Look at verse 11. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 11. If there's any question in your mind, verse 11 and following verses clears it up. Let us therefore be what? Diligent or zealous to enter into that rest. That restful place, that restful relationship with Jesus. That total trust in Him. Lest anyone fall after the same example of what? Disobedience. Disobedience. So we're not promoting disobedience, but Jesus wants us to be very clear on how we're saved. He wants us to strive, as some versions say, to work, to be diligent, to strive, to be zealous, to enter that place of rest with Jesus so we don't lose out because of unbelief expressed in disobedience. So a life of rest and trust produces loving obedience amen? amen and high morality and that's exactly what america needs right now high morality and high morality at its best is based on god's ten commandments and the bible's two greatest commandments love god with all your heart and love your neighbor as yourself that's the highest morality and our nation and our leaders of our nation need that morality as leaders and we need it too amen we need it too so we need a break we need a break from our from our past apathy we need a break from our from our moral compromises we need a break from our fears and our anxieties you know we need christ's peace and rest amen, amen. russell okum he was the former tackle for the Seattle Seahawks. And online, on the uh, crew website, he tells how his life changed. He said, when I was just a young boy, my dad died. My dad died, my own dad died. And so I was the oldest of the kids, and so I became sort of the head of the house, I thought. And I tried to help my mom, and I would, I would try to look after my brothers and sisters. And I became very independent. And I thought pretty much I could do anything I wanted to do. And I worked hard. And uh, I, I went to college and, I, and I, got a, I got a football scholarship. And I was pretty proud of that. And, and I was doing good. And I was, I was, my, now I had my goals on the pro, on pro ball. Football, pro football. That was my dream. And he said, uh, then he said, things started to unravel. He said I was away at college, and I knew I was supposed to be protecting my mom and my, my, my siblings. And, and then a terrible storm swept through our home city of Houston, Texas. And, and, and I got a call from my mom. She said, we're safe. She said, but there's, there's, there's deep water in our house. Our house is flooded. And, I, and he thought, oh, I'm way over here, and, and mom's over there. And she said, we, we'll make out all right. We'll do okay. You just keep on with your studies. And, and he, as he hung up the phone, he was really confused and discouraged. What should I, what am I supposed to be doing? You know, why is all these tragedies happening? My dad dies and my mom gets flooded out and I'm away and I can't come be there and help her. And soon after that at a chapel service at college, he said, God, Russell O'Toole said, God just said something to me. He said, it's funny how God speaks sometimes in very quiet whispers. He said, but I, I, I heard God speak in my mind, and he said, Russell, you don't have to do this alone. I'm with you. I'm, I'm here. And that's all that it took for Russell Atum to rededicate his life 
to Jesus Christ. And he's been a witness for Christ, even on the, even on the pro ball circuit. I think he's now with the Panthers. But, uh, you know, he found peace and rest in trusting his life to Christ, even though he thought he could do it all by himself. He found that his life became so much better when he entrusted his life in God's hands. And so, friends, we're going through some very unusual times. We've never seen anything quite like it in our lifetimes. There, it's, it's, uh, I, I believe these are signs that Christ's second coming is approaching, don't you? I believe that Jesus is coming back to this planet soon. And are you willing to put your whole life into the nail-scarred hands of Jesus Christ. Are you willing to do that today? Are you willing to enter into his rest? To be fully resting in him, fully trusting in him each day or each situation that comes. If you want to rededicate your life to Christ today, would you stand with me to indicate that you're in, you're asking God to give you that rest, you're rededicating your life to Jesus Christ, not just for Sabbaths, not just for when you study the Bible, but each day of your life, each day we can be experiencing the presence of Christ, His strength, His peace, His rest. As we rededicate our lives to you today. We don't know what's all going to happen in our country, in our county. But we thank you for the privilege of coming together today on this beautiful Sabbath day. We thank you for the privilege of following the example of Jesus. Trusting in God in troublous times. We thank you that your Holy Spirit will change our lives if we just open the door. Every morning, Lord, use us in your service. Let us be spreaders of good news, ones who disseminate light, love, and truth. Let us make a difference. This group right here, make a difference in our valley. We pray that this COVID virus epidemic will pass on through more quickly than predicted. That our schools can open in August and September with real classrooms. We pray that you'll protect us from sickness and we ask that you would guide us to be compassionate to those who are in need. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. God bless you, have a wonderful Sabbath and a great week resting in the strength of Jesus.